Our Father, we were just reminded in song of your mercy and grace and kindness, your protection, your provision, your drawing near to us in the person of Jesus Christ, your bountiful blessing in every respect according to our needs and beyond our needs. Lord, we would confess our adoration this day. We would say we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Heavenly Father. We love you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints, even now enjoying fellowship in this place among your people. We pray for your teacher, that you would help him to, to instruct us in the truth. You'd help us to be good students, good Berean hearers, gladly receiving and going to the scriptures to see that these things are so. And we would ask our Father, you who provide for all of our needs, that you would provide us the kind of teaching by your powerful hand, writing these things upon our hearts, not merely reminding us of things that we may already know, teaching us things that may be new to us, but with your finger writing these things upon the fleshy tables of our hearts so that we might not only adore you the more, but we might live for your glory. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good, not morning, but afternoon uh, to everyone. I hope we're all doing okay. <clears throat> I got our teas, our coffees, our waters, or just air for now. And uh, <laughs> um, so pretty much um, just for a short introduction. So, so far we've talked about baptism with Joe, teaching it. Um, about the biblical understanding of what is baptisms, the improper understanding of baptisms, like such as um, baptismal regeneration, um, the proper modes of baptism, and then things related to um, Pado Baptist, and specifically Presbyterian and Reformed Baptist um, um, debates on the subject of on this, on understanding who can receive baptism, infants or um, just believers, uh, adult believers. And as we move on to the next chapter, which is chapter 30 of the Confession, uh, on the Lord's Supper, uh, one thing uh, that comes up very clear is that this chapter, chapter 30, is one of the, uh, as one author wrote, one of the most explicit anti-papal, uh, anti-Roman Catholic chapters in the Confession. It's not the only one, but it's just, when you start reading, you start seeing, like, there's a constant theme of, this is what the Lord's Supper is, this is what it's not. And part of that is because, contextually, is because when we think about our um, Reformed Baptist forefathers in the, in the 1600s, they're dealing with the Church of England. There, is, there are still plenty of Roman Catholics ar around in the, land of, in the land of England. And there's a lot of controversy about what uh, should the church, uh, what is church, proper church doctrine and how should it be practiced. And plus, there's the and then there's all the fights against Roman Catholics across the continental um, Europe, Europe um, countries. And so, uh, when the Baptists adapt, adopt th um, this chapter from the Westminster and the Savoy, uh, they're having in mind the reality, the fact that there is false teaching that is uh, very popular in the in the minds of, of the people. And we have to have a proper understanding of what the Lord's Supper is, how it should be practiced. Um, and, and pretty much when we look at the, this chapter, uh, paragraph 1 pretty much states, uh, if you want to think about it this way, in summary form, what the Lord's Supper is. And then the rest of the chapter is pretty much a constant back and forth of this is what it is, this is what it's not. And... Um, with my, I already broke my original uh, plan for this chapter. Originally, I was going to do three weeks, and I, as I did the last thing, I was like, nope, never mind, that's not going to work out. So, it might be four weeks or five weeks. We'll see how things go. Um, but pretty much the, the basic plan for today is that we're going to uh, do something else before we go to chapter 30, and that is... Uh, we're going to take a step back from the discussion of baptism, the Lord's Supper, and talk about the idea of the means of grace. Um, and as we go through, the, through, go through the lesson, hopefully it will become clear why I'm doing so. And then, Lord willing, if I don't spend too much time uh, and cut my own time off, we'll address paragraph 1 of chapter 30. Um, this, so does that make sense so far? Any questions? Concerns? 
Call your SV joiners. Is there uh, <laughs> any immediate uh, uh, <coughs> background knowledge we need to know about the other contrasting beliefs or like things going in apart from what you just articulated? Well, pretty much the idea is that paragraph one is um, like a, um, the summary. And then pretty much as we're going to go through the rest of the paragraphs, we'll, I'll be going in more details about some of the backgrounds and all these things, uh, which is one of the reasons why I had to end up breaking my original, ske original schedule because I realized with some of this stuff, some more explanation is going to be needed. And I don't want to just rush through it all. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. <coughs> uh, so with that said then, uh, we're going to move on to the subject of the means of grace. Uh, uh, let me, well, let me ask the question first, I guess. Uh, when you hear the word means of grace, uh, what usually comes to your mind from your understanding, what, from what you have understood? You know, we, at times it's used in, in our church when, uh, whether we're talking, well, I'll pause right there. I can give some stuff away. I'll say the word, mm -hmm. prayer, different, different means of grace. Mm -hmm. So like so s different elements of the means of grace in this, and so in this case, like the word, prayer, preaching. Uh, the Lord's uh, prayer would be mm -hmm. like baptism. Mm -hmm. would, be fa would fasting count or would that be different? Because I know it's fasting is usually in addition to <coughs> prayer. prayer. Mm -hmm. The Methodists would think so. <laughs> All I can say is I don't have a direct comment on that. Uh, usually, with, with the, at least with the... Um, I think fasting could be, though. Well, anything that brings you closer, closer to, to God. God. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that yeah. brings you closer to God. That's, the, that's what you're thinking. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. At least the way I would think about it, maybe I'm... Correction, I need a correction on my part. The way I would think about it is that fasting in and of itself not necessarily, but it's the, in the fasting with the idea of prayer and all these things. Yeah, sure, that's what it helps. Yeah, exactly. Not just a diet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not just, <laughs> yeah, not just a diet, but something more than that. Oh. So, okay. Uh, I'm going to be like Joe. I'm going to be advertising some books today. Uh, there's co uh, there, uh, one book, a co couple books I'm going to be referring to throughout these uh, lessons. Uh, is one is a great book by Richard Barsolas, who uh, the name should be familiar. It was in our prayer meeting today. Um, this book, The Lord's Supper as a Means of Grace More Than a Memory, is a very short book, um, 120 pages, really easy to understand. You know, like this subject, you can get like head deep, all these, you know, complicated terminologies. Barsolas pretty much avoids a lot of that. He makes it clear to the point that anyone can understand what he's saying. And uh, the way he defines a means of grace in page 23 of his book is this. He defines it as, uh, the means of grace is the delivery systems that God has instituted to bring grace. That is, spiritual power, spiritual change, spiritual help, spiritual fortitude, and spiritual blessings to the needy souls on earth. Grace comes from our Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, ordinarily in conjunction with the ordained means. And you want to put it in a, sh in a shorter form. The means of grace are those conduits through which Christ alters, modifies, adjusts, changes, transforms, and develops souls on earth. And as Urban Bavink, I brought him up. But ever, as ever Bavink uh, says, Christ is and remains the acquisitor, ac yeah, acquisitor, as well as the, the distributor of grace. So he acquires and acquires it and he distributes it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> acquire it? Yeah, acquire it. So he's so Christ acquires grace through his work and ministry in his life and his death and resurrection, and he's also the one who distributes it then. So when we're talking about the means of grace, it is not a um, we have to be careful that we never think about it in an in like abstract way, but we always must remember that it's always in, in relation to what Christ has done and what He's doing in us and to us and through us. Um, you know, and, and one reason why the whole subject, the whole understanding what it means of grace, what they are, is important is because um, how we relate to our salvation. Because salvation isn't just uh, oftentimes, and for good reasons, we emphasize 
Uh, what is one of the uh, tenets of, what is, what is the famous Luther quote about um, the Reformation, about um, that justification by faith, faith alone, alone uh, <laughs> is the foundation of the church. You know, that's usually um, attributed to Luther and uh, often emphasized. And those are great and wonderful truths, and they sh never should be denied or altered. But at the same time, as we read scripture and as we hear from the preaching from the preaching from our own church, as we hear that the Christian life isn't just justified and that's it. But there's something more. God doesn't just make us um, it just doesn't just impute righteousness into us, but God desires and he does infuse um, maybe that's I can get the confusion, but he does um, br bring us toward holiness, in other words, sanctification. Uh, God saved us in justification, and then he continues to sanctify us. We're being saved here presently, being, being moved away from our sins, killing sins in our lives, sin being mortified in our lives, and being vivified by the Spirit, being uh, brought to further life and communion with the Lord. And the final a goal of that is glorification. Glorification. <laughs> um, so, so, so we see that there is this 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 whole process of salvation that God is doing in us, and having that recognition is important, um, and because the means of grace is, uh, if you want to put it in this way, when you talk about the means of grace, it uh, most often it involves the area of being saved. Uh, in other words, sanctification, uh, which, which is what Barcelo has kind of alluded to in his definition, the fact that God is bringing spiritual blessings. He's um, um, fortifying us in all these other things to needy souls on earth because that's what we are. We are needy souls. We are constantly need in the grace of Christ. If Christ stops giving us grace, we're in trouble. Uh, we're no longer going to have the eternal spiritual life that we ought to have, that we need. We are, we are, the Christ is, you want to put in, you want to think of it this way, is our blood, is our blood in our spiritual life. Of all Christ um, beating our hearts, we're dead. Um, <laughs> scared Cody. Um, um, so hopefully that makes sense, right? Any questions about that so far? Um, I have a question, but I don't know if they'll derail, so if it does, we can postpone it. But um, what's your... We like being derailed. What's your understanding of how come sanctification is a gradual process rather than an immediate process? Does that have to play with aspects like the Lord's uh, uh, Supper, things like that? <clears throat> Just say your question one more time. I just wanted to make sure I understand properly. Um, what's the reason behind sanctification being a gradual process than it, rather than an immediate process? Mm -hmm. So why is it that when we get, uh, come to faith that we don't instantly have, I guess, glorification, uh, perfect obedience, and things like that, rather than uh, gradual development over our, the course of our life? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, 50 rails. No, 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 it's fine. Um, I will say right away, I don't have a... Well, first of all, I, w we got to say f f like strip from uh, like f right away that in uh, one sense, it, this is an asp a... I want to I phrase it rightly. A... What about just... Would it be alright to say is a mysterious aspect of God's will? Yeah, but I, I think there, there is an answer to that, that um, we are to follow Christ who grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. And so it's not wrong to say that Jesus in his humanity was sanctified in a process. And we who follow him, he who learned obedience through the things that he suffered, even though he was a son, we are sons. We're going to follow in his footsteps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He wasn't glorified immediately, and we're not right. glorified immediately. Okay. The Savior wasn't, and those that he saves aren't. Mm -hmm. That's a short answer. 
<laughs> Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> God could have done that, but that wasn't his right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what I was kind of to, trying to allude to by the, the, the mystery that God in his infinite and good wisdom chose to, do, to uh, not have it in that way, but to have it the way that he reveals in Scripture, like Pastor said. Christ himself was sanctified in his in humanity, and so we ought to follow in his footsteps as well. Um, any other questions? I think, for, I mean, there, I guess my a clarification to that question is, I guess, not so much um, why he didn't choose, like, immediate, mm -hmm. or what was the mindset. Like, if there is scriptural um, articulation of God, God's motivation, reason for choosing gradual over an immediate process, as we've already mentioned that he's capable of doing it immediate, but chooses not to. And I, so I was curious if we have a, um, um, an articulation of why he chose that in Scripture, or if it's left at um, God's mysterious will. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, like I said... Well, I can't think of a text right now that would answer that question. Okay. Yeah, well, really you do have the promise that he that began a good work in you mm -hmm. will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even now that we are to grow in sanctification, mm -hmm. without which no one will see the Lord, and that we're be, to be obe we're to walk in the fear of God mm -hmm. and uh, perfect holiness thereby. Could you argue mm -hmm. that some of the passages about perseverance could apply in here, where God has a gradual work of sanctification in order to work perseverance through us as well, mm -hmm. to an extent? Well, I think I think perseverance is is in one sense the expression of progressive sanctification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to persevere, but God perfects us mm -hmm. in the process. Yeah. And he won't lose any one of his people for whom Christ died. He will complete that work that began with grace and ultimately leads to glory. There's, it's a one-way street. There's no, there's, there, there's no U-turns along the way. You know, one thing that comes to my mind in relation to that also is the, the idea of um, the fact that we're presently in the uh, present world, you know. Uh, on one side, we are participants of what some theologians call the age to come, but that's what it is. It, it is the age to come. It's not here yet. The new creation um, has been started, but it hasn't been fully consummated yet until Christ's coming. Yeah, we've tasted of the good things of the age to come, as mm -hmm. the writer of the Hebrews says. Yeah. But, you know, we've, and I say this reverently, we've just had the hors d'oeuvres. The full mm -hmm. meal awaits us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, uh, so, it, it's, so with that understanding, it kind of makes sense why, at least on one, on one side, it makes sense why things, God has it set up the way it is, because um, we're still waiting for the full consummation when all of creation um, in him and his elect people will be fully um, um, healed. Um, that's the word I'm thinking for. Um, glorified in all these things. Um, they're still. Um, yeah, we groan and travail in childbirth. Yeah. Until the revealing of the sons of God. That's what we're looking forward to. The revelation day in which our private adoption is made public before the gathered universe. And we receive our glorified bodies. And we shall see Christ as he is, but we shall be like him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's the yeah. picture. I, I, so. I, I guess uh, it's it's getting there. I think for at, at least for myself, I'm gonna have to ponder a little bit just in the fact of trying to understand God's mindset behind it. Because I feel like by understanding His mindset, His motivation for choosing that, I have a feeling it probably has to do with His suspected. Um, or a sus uh, I'm suspecting that probably has to do with the fact that he probably believes in a, that that method would bring him more glory in mm -hmm. the immediate process by maybe the testimony of our lives, mm -hmm. and gradual development. Yeah, yeah through our trials. Yeah, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's yeah. going to do whatever brings him the most glory. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in relation to uh, to connect all of this. Back to here, that and one of the no, 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 this connection, don't worry. Uh, in, in connection to all of this, we can, one of the ways that this is done is through the means of grace. That uh, through the constant trials, you know, when we are um, starving spiritually, uh, whether because of the world or and or because of ourselves, that God prov um, provides 
uh, we'll get into it in a second, but sanctifying grace, strengthening um, strength to us. And he is glorified in this constant battle in this present earth um, when he's preserving it, preserving us, protecting us, and helping us in all of our uh, uh, weaknesses and all these things. Um, so, uh, with that said, we're going to look at three main points regarding the means of grace and then hopefully move on to the first paragraph. Um, and this part of the lesson, next book I'm going to uh, um, let's, um, let's, let's plug, in, plug in, is uh, a new book that just came out um, by, um, it's called Green Pastors, Pastures, or how do you pronounce the word, uh, by J. Ryan Davidson, published by RBAP, um, Richard Barsolis, um, on, on the subject of the means of grace. Um, he kind of touches on the word, how the word, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and prayer, how they are all means of grace. Um, great book, also just like Barsolis' book, really easy to understand. Um, and gets to the point and that uh, you can give it to anyone to, uh, who's interested in this subject. And the way he kind of touches on the subject um, is uh, very helpful in my opinion. <clears throat> and one, uh, he kind of touches on three points about the means of grace. First, that God builds his people in grace. And you may, you may say, okay, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Um, but to help further illustrate this, if we go to our confession, you can go to your confession now, if you have one. Um, chapter 14, paragraph 1. The grace of faith by which the elect are enabled to believe so that their souls are saved is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts. Faith is uh, ordinarily produced by the ministry of the Word. By the, uh, by the same ministry and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer, and other means appointed by God, faith is increased and strengthened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what edition is that you're reading, Nolan? Um, all I know is it's um, it was online and it was a modernized translation. Oh, of it. By, yeah. by founders, right? Yeah, by yeah, founders. founders yeah. 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 Well, that's the one you read from recently. Right, right. Mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, pretty okay. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, Used to have a copy. It got lost somewhere. Is, is that the green one? Uh, it's like a lot of it looks like this cover. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just took your phone. I just, I didn't think about that. Sorry. Yeah. We're all, we're all family. We're all family. So, um, when we look at this paragraph, um, and of course, when you look at the what chapter of this part, this is on the subject of saving faith. And one thing we. we I mean, it, as, especially as um, Calvinists, we recognize this reality that faith is not from us, but even, even faith is a grace from God. So the very in, uh, conception of the Christian life of the gospel is all of grace. And that the people of God are given the grace of faith and they are built upon grace. And so you may say, okay, the confession says this. What about some scriptural, uh, scriptural passages that kind of touch on this subject? Um, there's a lot of passages that we could go to, but they're just gonna, we're just going to stick to a few. The first one is found in Acts chapter 20. Oh, I have to pull that out now. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 32. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the confession, just going back here real quickly, <clears throat> we see that toward the end, that the confession, uh, or toward the middle and toward the end, uh, the, the paragraph talks about how uh, talking about faith and all these things, how it is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, wi by which also by the administration of, of baptism, 
the Lord's Supper, prayer, and other means of, of God, it is increased and strengthened. Um, so in other words, that God has instituted means, in other words, um, ordinances, uh, things which help build up the Christian's faith and their life. And that it brings also sanctification to them as long as they, they are properly observed in all these things. And this passage helps us um, from one side to see this, because as we, uh, this is in the context, is Paul is, is giving his goodbye to the Ephesian churches. And he's telling them, he's telling them to be, telling to the elders, to be, uh, to pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church, of God which he has obtained with his own blood. So that the overseers, the elders of the church, are ordained so that they can help care for the church. And you may ask, okay, how do they care for the church? And Paul talks about how they're supposed to be watching out for wolves and all these things. And then toward the end uh, of 32, verse 32, Paul says this, I now commend you to God. And then the next part and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So we see what Paul is saying here is that the, the word of God is able to build you up. That God has given his word, and amongst many other the other means, ordinary means, to build up the faith of the Christian people. How are they to continue um, the, the life of the church? How are they to continue to uh, fight the good fight? How are they to persevere in the faith? Now, amongst the many things, one of the greatest means is through the ordinary means of grace that God has given. One of which, what Paul mentions here, is the Word of God. And if we go to Colossians chapter, actually, um, we'll go to the parallel text first. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, <clears throat> which, uh, Corbin, you can read. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we see here that, which in this wonderful passage, Paul is speaking to both Jews and Gentiles that we are no longer enemies, no longer there's no barrier, but we're now one in Christ. Christ has uh, broken, has teared down that divi wall of division. All believers are saved by grace and grace alone and all these elements involved. And he then talks about how we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and that Christ is that cornerstone. So Christ is the foundation, the cornerstone of our Christian salvation. And not only that then, he then says that in him you're also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we see that Christ is the cornerstone and there's then the apostles and then prophets on um, whom we have the revelation of God and that through um, all these means that God is continually building up His church, individually and also collectively. And that the purpose of all of this is to establish and complete that wonderful and holy temple of God. <clears throat> Any questions about that so far? Concerns, failures, rejoinders? Okay, so we see that God, well, that makes sense, that, that's understand, yeah. that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, at least, just understands. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just teasing you guys. Um, so we see that God builds his people in grace. And the second element re get regarding this is, um, it kind of was mentioned already before, but we're going to say it again, that God builds his people with the means, with, uh, with 
specific means that he has instituted. And these means are meant to um, show grace and to, um, um, yeah, show grace upon the people of God. So could you say they're like a conduit, a channel through mm -hmm. which Christ mediates his grace? Yeah. And one example I've heard from, um, you want to have an illustrative example, uh, from one, uh, one guy I read on this subject. The way he illustrated it was kind of funny for me. But imagine if you are a, in a, a marathon runner, running 24 miles. Okay. Uh, running 24 miles. Uh, so what's going to happen toward the end? You're going to have to run 2.2 .2 more. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to run harder. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're, okay, that's it. But you're going to be thirsty, right? Yeah. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to need something to quench that uh, thirst, right? And so let, let's say this is a little bit more of a, um, I'm not sure what the right phrasing is, less fancy uh, marathon. And instead of having like, a, uh, instead of having a cups of waters and water bottles, they have it on a hose. <laughs> so you get, so the water is coming out of the hose. Now, when you when you finally see, get to the end, you see that hose that's you know squirting out water. What what is your attention going to be toward on the hose or the water? The water. The water. No, the hose is great. You know, it's 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 bringing that water from that source all the way down to you, and you can grab that hose and drink until you fall over full of water. Um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Um, to, to apply to, to apply this in the spiritual in this uh, to show how this applies to the means of grace that the means of grace are in a sense that hoes that the, the that they are um, there are means in which God pours out His grace upon His people. Um, the means themselves don't do it, but it is through the proper observation and through faith, uh, especially that. God pours out these sanctifying grace upon his people. That is an important point. We'll, in later lessons, explain why. Um, um, does that illustration work for you guys? I hope. It worked for me. I was like, wow, this is an interesting way of looking at it. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and one passage that can also help us understand um, this idea of the means of grace and how God uses, uh, uses these means and how they're a blessing upon the Christian people is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2-4. to four. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called, you, uh, called us to glory and virtue. Right, he's giving us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What's, what's interesting is that Paul, Peter, I was supposed to say Paul, Peter in the beginning of verse 2 talks about that may grace and peace be multiplied to you. You know, and in Maybe we don't all do this, but maybe we have a concert folks who use that kind of language, you know, whether like at the end of the email, you know, they say, hey, grace and peace be multiplied to you or, you know, things like that. But when we, you know, think about what Peter is saying here, he's saying that may grace and peace be just added to you, Multiple. multiplied to you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it, Peter is wishing uh, not just, you know, it's, it's not just some small amount of grace, but he's, he's wishing upon the Christian people a grace that keeps growing beyond measure that you can't count it. And that um, we see that Peter continues his flow of thought throughout the rest of this passage. And that how is grace and peace to be multiplied to you? Well, Immediately, right after that, he says, in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, which, where is that found? In the scriptures and the other means of grace, where baptism points to Christ, the Lord's Supper points to what Christ has done in prayer and communication to the Lord and all these things. And that through these means, that, uh, and by his divine power that he, he has granted to us, that it provides life, godliness. And that uh, through all these things that 
uh, he grants us, as Peter says, his precious and very great promises. And so that the means of grace are meant to be a blessing upon the people of God. And that as the older, uh, well not older, but as uh, the, um, at least in the Reformed tradition, the way the, lang the language is uh, usually used is the idea of the ordinary means of grace. Um, and why do we, why is the language of ordinary means of grace used? The reason why we t talk about it in that way is because we're, what, we're trying, what we're trying to say is this. Yes, God um, can and does uh, use other things to, you know, prefer, um, work in us. Uh, at times there are trials in our lives and God uses those things to, uh, you know, shake us up and say, um, you got a problem. You have a problem of your sin of pride. You love your coworkers. Uh, you are haughty. You think you're all that. You think you're the best. And this trial is here to show you, you need to repent of your sin, for example. Um, but when we're talking about the ordinary means of grace, what we're saying is that these are the things that God has instituted and made for us, for the Christian believers, that they may use regularly ordin uh, in their every week, every day, every week of their lives. So that, for example, Scripture, through the ordinary reading and proper, you know, in faith and all these things, even if we don't see it right away, it does provide fruits upon the believers. And of course, we know this most especially because what, is Paul, what does Paul say in Romans 10? You know, if they don't hear, they can't believe. That by the word of God, we see the seed of that very grace implanted. Regeneration is by the hearing of God. You can't, you can't believe you don't know the word, you don't know the gospel. And so, the, so with the other means of grace, uh, they are sanctifying grace. That's the key idea. They don't regenerate, they don't justify, but they are sanctifying. Um, and we'll talk about other views in later lessons regarding that stuff. And that's why, um, especially, not that, it's just, not that it's limited only to the Reformed tradition, but the Reformed tradition especially has emphasized the idea of the fact that that's why you have to have proper preaching on the Lord's Day. For it is how the Lord, through this means, blesses His people. And same with the Lord's Supper, that through the proper and good observance of it, that the people of God are blessed and reminded of the sacrifice of Christ and are blessed through all of that. Um, and the way, again, Davidson talks about it, is that the means of grace, uh, just another definition, another way of uh, look, uh, thinking about it, is that they are the instruments that Christ ordinarily uses to birth and strengthen the faith of the elect as he is present among them. And that last part is something to also th to remember, the fact that, well, let me ask you this guys this question. Christ, is he here present with us physically? No. No. He, uh, he is bod he, bodily, he's in heaven. But he is not absent with us. He is, with, with his, he is always with his people spiritually. If he wasn't, then we could not be united to Christ. We could not have the Spirit with us. And so that it is through these uh, means that Christ is working, is present with us. He's working in us. And, um, in that, and that's why these means are instituted, to um, bless the people of God. Any questions or comments about that so far? Um, just to make sure I'm he mm -hmm. hearing understand, uh, understanding it correctly. So the ordinary means of grace would, in a sense, be the objective um, collective experience of all Christians. Something, in ex in, let's say, like a resource available to all Christians that they will unanimously, unanimously experience uh, the same benefit or consequence from that resource. Would you say that's a 
correct articulation of it that even though there's subjective experiences we can develop like you were giving the example of the workplace mm -hmm. that's not experience that necessarily crosses over to all believers where not all believers can necessarily experience that but all believers can experience scripture um, preaching prayer um, the sacraments mm -hmm. like that. would you say that's an accurate understanding of it if I understand you correctly, in the sense that, that these are th these are things that God has given for all the people of God? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes, exactly. Um, well, with that said, and time is quickly running out, um, um, we'll move on quickly to the third point regarding the means of grace. And that is, um, so we talk about how God builds his people in grace. God builds his people in grace through the means that he provides now the question is, what are those means? Um, you know, it's kind of makes sense, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo. Um, you are correct. <clears throat> and um, ordinarily, uh, there are several main things that are usually um, you described as the ordinary means of grace. First is the Word of God, and we're not going to go through all the scripture references regarding these things. I'm just going to yeah, say them um, just for the sake of time. Uh, the Word of God and the preaching of it and the hearing of it thereof, which hopefully that, that language sounds familiar from yeah. earlier in the chapter 26, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and also with that prayer, um, private and public prayer. Um, and finally, the two ordinances, or as some uh, other, uh, another language for them, the sacraments. Um, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, and as Joel has touched on the topic of baptism, now we're going to move on to the topic of the Lord's Supper. Uh, but before we do that, <laughs> um, I want to do like a sh very sh short, short story, because you can go a really long rabbit trail on this. Uh, it, on the whole language of ordinances and sacraments. Um, Joe sort of touched it on uh, touching on it before, but I'm just going to do it for, rep uh, for repetition because that's never a bad thing to do. Um, um, when you look at your confession, uh, chapter 28, uh, the confession, at least in, in the Baptist confession, I'll be more specific, it uses the language of ordinances. And so, there's, and so the question becomes, uh, did the Baptists reject the language of sacraments? Uh, the, long, the short answer is no. Uh, when you look at the preaching, whether it's Keech, Hercules Collins, etc., uh, uh, they, they use both. At one sentence, you use language of ordinance, and the very next sentence, you say sacraments. So it's used interchangeably. Um, so, the next, so the next question may be, okay, what does sacraments mean? Um, the short answer, the, the super short answer is, depends who you ask. <laughs> um, but obviously as, ref as, reform as um, Christians who hold to a, a reform understanding, we do not agree with Roman Catholics or other perspectives on what, when they use the language of sacraments. So what do, we, what do we mean when we use language of ordinances and sacraments? Um, when you look at the roots of the word sacraments, it has the idea in, in the Latin of sacramentum, which means mystery. Uh, and pretty much it relates to the idea of how um, the, there is a, as some of the older writers would say, a mysterious element to baptism and the Lord's Supper. And when they're talking about mystery, they don't mean like, ooh, we don't know what's going on. <laughs> That's not what they mean. What they mean is that there is a spiritual reality going on here. Um, and of course, for Roman Catholics, they think it means one thing. As Baptists, um, Reformed Baptists, we don't agree with them. Um, and when we mean that there's a spiritual reality, we mean that, that there is a spiritual blessing going on. Of course, like for example, when it comes to baptism, as Joel has talked about a couple times already, that baptism itself does not regenerate you. It does not justify you. But there is something going on with the Christian. It is a... a it, it is God's promise to the believer. That the, and it points them to, it, it is a, uh, as Augustine says, it is a visible word to the Christian. Um, and in, that's another way of looking at baptism, the Lord's Supper. It is a visible word. 
you may ask, okay, what does that mean? Um, we hear the preaching of the word, right? Every single Sunday, um, unless you're sick or absent or whatever else. But ordinarily, every Lord's Day, we hear the preaching of the word of God. And, oh boy. And so, um, and so, when, so when, we're, when, we, when some writers use the language of the visible word, what they're saying is this, that the promises of the gospel are made manifest, are, man, are manifested in a visible way to the believers. And even in this, we can see the wisdom of God in all of this. Because uh, God is the one who made us. And He knows that we're not only hearing creatures, but we're also... Doing. Well, doing and seeing creatures, right? <laughs> uh, we, 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 are, we are, you know, multi, multifaceted creatures um, with multiple senses. Our taste, our hearing, our sight, etc. Um, and that w with the two sacraments, the, what's going on is that not only do we have the preaching of the Word of God in the prayers, um, which you can say is the invisible Word of God, um, vis invisible Word in the sense that you don't, you're not seeing it, but you're hearing it and receiving it in that way. With the Lord, baptism and the Lord's Supper, it is the visible Word. You're able to see it and experience it. Not, the water itself, as for example, as Joy has emphasized, itself doesn't you know, justify you. But it is something special to the Christian. It is God's, it, it is in a visible form of God's promise that you have been united to Christ. You have died with Him and you have been risen up with Him and that you are washed clean in His blood. Uh, in other words, it is a sanctifying grace. And same with the Lord's Supper, that it is it is the body and blood of Christ, not there physically, but made, uh, we'll get to this later, the bread says bread, the cup says what it says. It does not turn into blood, doesn't turn in, the, the bread doesn't turn into physical flesh of Christ, but it represents it. It is a visible word that helps us to uh, understand the promises of God, and not just understand it, but receive them. And, and the, way it's, the way it's often said is that to be spiritually fed. And we'll get more into that, what that means in later lessons. Um, does that make sense? A uh, question. Yes. So by word, do you mean the expression of like the gospel? Yes. Okay. Yep. So we're not just saying like some random words, but like the word as in the promises of the gospel. Any, que any further questions or comments about that? Okay. Um, now I've got to make the hard decision. Um, <laughs> well, we do have time. Is this a matter of whether I want to... Um, how about this? Uh, Due to the sake of time, um, I'll make this. I'll make the decision myself. Come on, separate. Come on, Nah, <laughs> this is a dictatorship. Uh, um, we're 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 gonna end the lesson at this point for today. We could go further, but I don't want to end up. I don't want to have a situation where we end up, you know, cutting it short and you know, it's kind of the, the the lesson kind of gets cut off like that. Um, so we're actually gonna end. Sooner today, guys. What? Oh. Woo! Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Did, did I? Uh, makes it easier for you to edit. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. Actually, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no. But, um, but before we end off, I do want to read at least one quote. Uh, False ending. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We're done, but not yet. Not yet. Yeah, exactly. Done, but not yet. <laughs> um, a quote from Spurgeon um, on one, by one of, his, one of his sermons on the Lord's Supper. And this is toward the, toward the end of his sermon. And the reason why I want to read this um, quote is because um, to, for many reasons, but uh, one of the reasons is because to help us see what a blessing indeed the means of grace are 
to the people of God. And this is the quote from Spurgeon toward the, end, toward the end of his sermon. He says, Lord, I cannot love you as I wish to love you, but I can accept your love. Let your love drop into my heart just now. Lord, I cannot serve you as I wish to, but I adore you because you do become my servant and wash my feet as you did your disciples' feet. Lord, I cannot bring you coals of fire from my chilly heart, but here is my heart. Come and cast the coals of fire of your own divine love into it. The means of grace is God's outpouring of love upon us. That there is our you know, participation of it, you know, ought to be done in faith, in the proper manner, but ultimately and fundamentally, it is God's acting upon us, working the gospel in us, reminding us the gospel, sanctifying us in all of this, so that we may be conformed to the image of His Son. For we have been justified, and He is sanctifying us, so that we may be glorified and be with Him in the new creation. And I'll close it off at that point. Should I pray for food too? Or? Okay. Our Lord God, we thank you for this blessed Lord's Day that you've given to us. We thank you for the fact that we have the privilege to sing wonderful songs of your acts. Not just acts that you have done in the past, but acts of grace that you've done upon us who believe. And we thank you, likewise, Lord, that we can have these means of grace that you give to us. Even as today we have participated in the prayer, in the word, and in the supper. And we thank you, Lord, that you reveal all these things to us, that we may see your wonderful care for and love toward us that you have not abandoned us, but you are always with us in the Spirit. Help us to not forget about these realities, but always recognizing them. And that we, you may continue to work in us through these ordinary means of grace. We don't need any crazy things, Lord, but you have given us these simple and wonderful things for us, which are sufficient to Help us to love you more, to grow in our faith, and to seek after your will. And we pray likewise, Lord, for the food that you give to us. And we ask that you may bless our flesh as we eat the food and bless our time of fellowship and our talks, that they may be good talks, talks that build each other up in all of our things, in all of our lives, that we may think that we, that we may see what we can, we can pray for each other or what to think about and all the many more things. That this Lord's day may continue to be kept holy. And we pray and ask this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.